My name is Kenny Redpath and I'm the events officer at the library. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce Gregory J. Kenneser, who is here to talk about his new book, Scottish Plant Law, An Illustrated Flora. Dr. Kenneser is a botanist at Edinburgh's Royal Botanic Garden. His PhD looked at DNA, diversity and evolution of pulses. After its completion, he returned to Edinburgh and joined the Royal Botanic Gardens thriving education department, who he has worked ever since. I think we're in for a real treat tonight. And just a note to say, Greg will try and answer as many questions as he can after the event, so get thinking. But for now, hopefully, over to you, Greg. Great, many thanks. Can you hear me okay, as is? Yes. Yep, great stuff, thanks very much. Well, it's a great pleasure to be talking to everybody here, um, and we'll see if we can get our presentation up. Um, I'll just see if this will behave itself. This is all fairly new technology, but stuff that we'll all have to get used to in the coming uh, months. Here we are. So. Okay, so hopefully that's everybody able to see. Um, what we're looking at today. This is the, the book that we produced down at the garden, Scottish Plant War and Illustrated Flora, which was an absolute pleasure to work on. Um, it's one that, as the name suggests, looks at the flora of Scotland and just investigates lots of that really fascinating lore. And that's what we'll look at now is some of the, the really interesting ways in which people have used plants and interpreted plants over the years in this quite interesting new country. So, excuse me, is that? behaving itself. There we go. So just to put things into context, when we look at um, plants and plant diversity, and particularly how people use plants, the way that we use plants, it's not a static thing. It's a very, very dynamic thing. And if you look at this little corner up here of Europe that, that is Scotland, the influences that there have been in terms of cultural influences are enormous. And that, that's things coming in from many, many different parts of Europe and of course in more recent times the wider world as well. So right from about um, something like 9,000, 8,000 years ago we had um, hunter-gatherer societies in Scotland and they of course made a huge amount of, of use of the plants that were there. Then we had agriculture coming in with a very different way and a kind of quite innovative way of using plants. Then successive waves of different groups of people, traders and everybody all bringing in these quite wonderful ideas. In many cases, they weren't just bringing ideas about how to use plants, but also the plants themselves. And this is a couple of them. And I just kind of include these because the book itself mostly looks at native plants. It was part of a, a project where we were looking at the native plants of lots of different countries and amazing botanical illustrators for each of the different countries that was involved in this big project would illustrate these native plants. And what a native plant is, is a plant that naturally got to a particular area. So in Scotland, for example, we have a relatively limited flora um, of just over a thousand or so native plants. But things like these two here are a great example of non-native plants. These were ones that were, in these cases, intentionally brought in by humans. So we have on the right hand side here, Egopodium podograria. Now that uh, has lots and lots of different names. Uh, you might, if you live in Britain, in Northern Europe, you might have this in your garden. Um, and if you do, you probably curse it a bit because it's a really quite invasive weed. But we think it was originally brought to Scotland from continental Europe by monastic communities because it was a quite important medicinal herb. This is often called bishop weed or gout weed. And that's thought to be because the bishops of, from the monastic communities were supposed to be the people that often got gout. Allegedly, they would drink lots of wine and that would give them this quite painful condition and um, causing swelling of the legs. And the treatment that you would use for that was this thing here, bishop weed or gout weed, also known as ground elder. So an interesting plant, really useful in the past. It makes a really interesting kind of um, like spinach like vegetable as well. So foragers will, will often take this, but you've got to be supremely careful because it looks like quite a lot of potentially toxic plants. 
On the left hand side here, we've got Sweet Sicily. This is Mirus odorata, another plant that was introduced probably by monastic communities, but possibly by the Romans. And this is wonderful. This has got a really sort of soft leaf and a really nice pleasant fragrance to it as well. A slight aniseed smell to it. And you can use the, the leaves in cooking. And that's probably what people did uh, for sweetening things up as well, giving flavour and medicinally too. But one of its big uses was in medieval times, taking these leaves and just throwing them on the ground. It was what's called a strewing herb. So people would throw the leaves on, on the, um, the floor of their house in which they lived and they might well live you know, with large families and sometimes even with livestock in the same house. So it could have got quite smelly in that house. And the idea behind a strewing herb like Sweet Sicily was to mean that when you walked over the leaves, you get this lovely fragrance and that would hopefully get rid of the smell of unwashed bodies. So there's lots of wonderful plants that have been brought in and have become part of our native flora. But let's turn to the, the other plants, the, the, the native ones as well, and some of the people who we found out that knowledge from, because we are very lucky. We did have people like Robert Sibold, who's shown here, and Martin Martin, later on James Robertson and John Lightfoot, um, all of whom were botanists or physicians as well, so doctors, and they collected a whole host of really interesting snippets and stories. Now, it never gives you the full picture of exactly how people were using things, but it means we do have a really rich written history that's been brought down. In parallel to that, we've also got a really interesting oral history as well. And that was what was collected by people like Alexander Carmichael, who was a Gaelic speaking tax collector, um, but who also in the late, kind of 1900, late 1800s, he collected a whole host of really interesting stories and phrases and, and sayings um, and collated them together into a book called Carmina Gadelica. Um, and that's really, fascinating book. It's got lots of different aspects of rural life, um, in, particularly in the Gaelic speaking areas, um, and lots of little snippets of lore in there. So these were the kind of places we, we turned to to find out our information, um, and a lot of that's readily available now online. And then we've got a lot more contemporary writers as well, so people like Mary Beath who um, wrote lots on, again, the Gaelic speaking parts of Scotland, but she looked in particular at medicine and medicinal aspects of plants. Uh, similar to Anne Barker um, and then uh, William Millikan and Sam Bridgewater and Tess Darwin have written on quite quite wide aspects as well. We're also really lucky because there's a lot of linguistic studies and dictionaries uh, that look at plant names in particular. Now I might tend to use um, the Latin names for things, I'll try and give English names as well, but I've been conditioned over many years to try and use Latin names. Um, that's just part of the story, because one of the beautiful things about plants, of course, is that everybody gives them different names. When you were a child, I suspect, many of us would have had our own kind of pet names for particular plants that you knew you could pop the head off, or um, you could, that, that classic one that you could stick on to other people. That's one, a plant that we have here is very often called Sticky Willy or Sticky Willow. It's like kind of one of its common names, um, but there are some others as well. So one of the bits that we did for the, this uh, book was to try and collate together a host of different plant names from across Gaelic, Scots and English in Scotland. And even though we have quite a small flora, there are almost 10,000 different names for just over a thousand different plants. And it, it shows just how rich people's understanding of plants truly is. It's great. So this thing here on the top left is something in Latin, it's called Petasites hybridis, sometimes known as butter burr, because these big leaves were used to wrap up butter. That's maybe its most common name. Um, but there's a really nice name for it as well, just flapper bags, quite a recent name, this one. Um, and that's possibly because when these leaves get a bit old and saggy and fall over, they look a little bit like an old plastic bag. So a nice kind of modern name. And then down on the right hand side, for many of you who, who live in, in Europe and through lots of the Northern Hemisphere, or in temperate areas in particular, you might well know this. This is, of course, dandelion. So it has names like uh, pisoli in French, so or pee the bed, because apparently if you touched it, um, it would be diuretic, even just touching it, and it could cause you to wet bed. So children were often told not to touch it. But there's another really nice little local name in Scotland, which sounds rude, but I promise it's not. Okay, and it's bum pipe, because. That's, that sounds like it's referring to something quite rude, but in fact it's not. I don't know if you can make out, you may not be able to see my mouse, but 
just where we've got these two yellow flower heads, this red stalk here, this stem that holds up that flower head there, um, those are actually hollow and you can break them apart and you can make them into a kind of kazoo uh, or a little whistle and make a humming noise. And bum, in this case, isn't rude at all. It just refers to that humming noise. So bum is hum in some parts of Lanarkshire, for example. So I just love how you've got something such a familiar plant that many of us know as dandelion, and we have collected well over 20 different local names for it. Superb. So the way we looked at it, putting the book together was to look at it by habitat. There's lots of different ways we, we could have chosen to do it, but um, that, that seems to fit quite nicely. So it's a bit of a tour that we'll go on just from the seashores and we'll make our way up towards the mountains and then we'll end up from there um, in the, the city. So we pulled out lots of different really interesting useful plants, I think, from our native flora. And many of them were beautifully illustrated by these illustrators as part of this project. Um, but we also included some things like this. This is marum grass, which is used quite widely um, for weaving um, and making into basketry. Uh, a coastal grass, really quite tough and quite resistant. But for this, we chose to illustrate it with a picture from our herbarium. So the herbarium at the Botanic Garden in Edinburgh has over 3 million preserved specimens of plants. It's an incredible, really useful resource for researchers around the world. So yeah, that's a wonderful plant and a really nice photograph. And then for the illustrators, they produce things like this, which are just delightful. So this is Margaret Walty's um, look at seaweeds, choosing some of the, what happens to be really the, the most useful seaweeds in particular. And around Scotland's coasts, we do have a really rich diversity of different seeds which have become incredibly versatile and used for a lot of things in the past. So here you can see things like on the top left we have sugar kelp or sugar rack which is used um, as a foodstuff that was eaten kind of quite commonly. It's got this mannitol sugar in it that makes it quite sweet at times although it is also of course salty and iodine as well. Touch down to the bottom left here we've got the green seaweed there that's sea lettuce which as the name implies you can eat like a lettuce a bit. Uh, and on the right hand side we've got uh, egg rack or knotted rack, Ascophyllum nodosum, one of these big brown seaweeds that's just a fundamental thing for putting on to the crops. And that was one of the things that, that people all around the coast would go and collect large amounts of these brown seaweeds and put them onto their crops to help them grow. Now Margaret's illustration here, I'm afraid on any presentation like this online, it won't do justice to the kind of vivid colour and the rich texture she's got from the acrylic which just give them that really nice proper filmy seaweedy feel. And you can kind of compare that with some of the other things. Now, one of the things that we saw there in Margaret's illustration, this one down here towards the bottom right, the red one, is dulse. And that was one of the real classics in Scottish historical use. And you can still find it today quite readily. Um, and you, a few companies do sell it. And this is it here. And I just thought I would pull out one of the quotes from Martin Martin, who was a Gaelic speaking uh, physician who collected a whole host of really interesting different ways of using plants around uh, Scotland in the late 1700s, but late 1600s. And he says, a large handful of the sea plant dulse growing upon stone, being applied outwardly, as is mentioned above, takes away the afterbirth with great ease and safety. This remedy is to be repeated until it produces the desired effect, although some hours may be intermitted. The fresher the dulse is, the operation is the stronger, for if it's above two or three days old, little is to be expected from it in this case. Plant seldom or never fails with success, though the patient had been delivered of several days before. And of this I've lately seen an extraordinary instance at Edinburgh in Scotland, where the patient was given over as dead. So we have these beautiful gems of little tracts of information, where you have this person, Martin Martin, recording a traditional use, and a really quite interesting medicinal traditional use. So as a way of, if the afterbirth placenta wasn't flushing after a child had been born, people would use this um, this seaweed. And um, we don't quite know why, that's what's really interesting, that's the only information we have for it. So it's sometimes a bit of a leap of the imagination is required to think maybe it was one of these ideas of the doctrine of signatures. It may be that because this dulse looks a bit like a human placenta, it might have been used to treat that potentially quite dangerous condition. Uh, my, I like to think, however, if you took any big lump of wet, fresh seaweed and dropped it onto your stomach, it would make your stomach contract hugely and maybe push out anything um, from the womb as well. So a really quite intriguing one that I think shows nicely that historical information is fascinating, really intriguing, but 
um, it's always filtered through just individuals who are telling us their perception of things. And this uh, is, is kind of in contrast to Margaret Walty's piece. This is Lee Tyndale's uh, Laminaria picture. So this is one of the big brown seaweeds. I think just captures exactly how this seaweed sits when it's um, in the water in particular, just kind of nodding over like this. So this was a, a work in progress and the work is uh, finished in the actual um, piece itself, you know, the book itself. But this brown seaweed and all the other big brown seaweeds are one of the, the things that were collected and not just put as compost, um, or manure, if you like, for growing crops. They were also used for this, so for producing kelp. So this is a, an illustration here where it shows a woman who has a huge big pit on the shore, I think in Orkney, and this enormous amount of brown seaweed around her. And she, she'll feed this fire in the pit and it just keeps slowly burning through. And as it does so, the ash that comes out of it's this really quite strange very very mineral rich ash and you get a very high proportion of this ash back from burning it and that was actually really useful uh, for making glass for using as a fertilizer on fields for bleaching linen and it was a huge industry and indeed the lairds around a lot of the parts of the coast of scotland really encouraged people to do this kelp burning industry through the 17th, uh, 18th and um, early 19th centuries and it made the lairds a lot of money but it was hard work very hard work indeed. And like many of these things, eventually the bottom fell out of the industry because alternative sources of things like iodine and um, potash came in instead. And that meant that when that industry failed, the lairds ended up turning to something else instead. And of course, what they turned to was sheep. So the failure of the kelp industry ultimately was one of the things that precipitated the highland clearances. And it, it just shows, I think, how these plants that are around us have completely shaped our society as they do today. I just thought I'd give you another little quote before we leave the seashore and start moving inland um, from Martin Martin again and he's talking about this little plant here this little cabbagey plant down on the bottom right hand side um, with the heart-shaped leaves scurvy grass it's called. He says this rock affords a great quantity of scurvy grass of an extraordinary size and very thick. The natives eat it frequently as well boiled as raw Two of them told me they happened to be confined on the rock for the space of 30 hours by a contrary wind and being without victuals fell to eating this scurvy grass and finding it of a sweet taste far different from the land scurvy grass they ate a large basket full of it which abundantly satisfied their appetites until their return home. They told me also that it was not the least windy or any other way troublesome. That's, that's really nice again. I love Martin Martin seems to be slightly obsessed with flatulence I have to say but that actually tells us quite a lot about how people saw diagnosis of medicine. So because there wasn't all the modern diagnostic tools that, that you have, people would be much more aware of what their intestines were doing. And doctors like Martin were always thinking, OK, what's happening to, is that person's face very flushed and red? Are they sweating a lot? Um, or is their, their stomach upset? Are they flatulent? That kind of thing as well. Um, so you often get some quite interesting interpretations of how plants were used and particularly the, the symptoms that diseases can cause and how the plants would help fix those diseases as well. So we'll move in just up the rivers, up the wetlands, um, and this is just a, a river in the borders of Scotland. Uh, on the left hand side here we can see um, a, an alder at the river. Here. Okay. And this is our illustration of Alder that we have in the book by Sharon Tingey. And it's done in a style that um, is kind of classic botanical illustration style. So looking at lots of different elements and showing the plant through the course of the year. We've got the profile of the plant in winter, for example. And that's one of the styles that we have. Uh, but then you'll see with the other illustrations in there, there's a, a huge range of different elements that are there. And Alder is a really intriguing plant. Um, it's one that has quite dark red wood that's very, very water resistant. So it was used as the piles, the main posts that were used to make the, um, the jetties, the kind of um, like small bridges that went out to the cranogs, which were the, the kind of lake or uh, loch huts or loch um, buildings that were out in the middle or the side of lochs and they would have these posts that held them up because alder is very uh, rot resistant in water. That was always what was used. And there's some wonderful artifacts as well, like uh, that have been made from single pieces of alder, huge trunks of alders that 
we almost don't have any alders like that anymore nowadays uh, that were hollowed out um, and then because they were water resistant again you could put butter into these huge big um, these big buckets put the top on seal it off with wax and then you could sink it into a bog and the bog would keep the, the butter cool fresh and preserved so if you ever visit the National Museum of Scotland you'll see some really amazing older bog uh, older bog buckets there we go. that's a difficult one to say I have to say um, but if you look inside them they've got this beautiful rich red color to the wood and interestingly that has been interpreted in the past as being blood so people believed that the reason it was red was because alder had been used to make the crucifix and the blood inside the wood was the plant's guilt uh, having been used to make the crucifix that, that Jesus was crucified on and you get lots of really interesting stories for different types of trees that tie them into the crucifixion or tie them into other religious aspects as well and are used to explain some of the particular traits of the tree really quite interesting little things They're great so moving yeah, up our river again, maybe to a bit of slightly kind of smaller stream, we get to this. And this is a really interesting plant because almost all of these monkey flowers you'll find um, through the Americas. They're almost all native to, to the Americas. And this thing here has been brought over probably as an ornamental plant and has escaped from gardens maybe 150 years ago or something like that. But what happened with some individuals in Shetland is that they underwent a genetic change and they didn't quite form a new species, but they formed a new, very local variety. So even though this is a plant that you might say is non-native, brought over by humans, over time, and actually quite a quick time, only 150 years, it's undergone this genetic change and it's ended up, to a degree, adapting to the conditions in Shetland. Now you can't find this same plant back in Alaska, this is this is a mutated version in a way and it shows us how these plants can can form new species and, and uh, like evolve over time essentially and Janet Watson who sadly is, is no longer with us she was a botanist for her background so she was particularly keen to do this this monkey flower and she really captured the vivid yellow of the, the petals superbly I think and I hope we're okay for time I'll uh, try and speed up a little bit uh, but also in wetlands, in bogs, we have this little thing, which is one of my favourite plants. This is butterwort, uh, which is named because you could take this, it's actually a carnivorous plant, quite small indeed. You could take this plant and people used to drop it into milk and it would curdle the milk. To a degree, that's possibly because of some of the enzymes it uses to digest insects on it. Um, but in Lanarkshire, for example, it was used uh, in the cheese making industry. So really quite important for that. And this is when the, uh, Russell's illustration and we have a photo here as well of the individual. And I just thought I would pull out some of these names as well. So the names that are applied to this are things like butterwort and butter plant. We can understand these. Erning grass is one of the Scots names. Erning in that case means curdling. Um, and some of the Gaelic names relate to that as well. But we also see things like rock grass and sheep root. And that relates to another thing that people felt about butterwort was if you took your sheep out and let them graze and they ate butterwort then it would uh, potentially give them a really horrible disease that rots off their hooves and, and their, their feet really badly. Um, as far as I can tell it's not the plant's fault that that happens, it's more if you have your sheep grazing in exactly the kind of habitat, the bogs that this plant lives in, then there's a really high chance of causing some kind of foot rot in the sheep. But this poor plant seems to have adopted the blame for, for this um, bit of interesting animal husbandry. Bit of a shame, I have to say. But a wonderful little plant. So we'll pop into a bit drier area now and, and go to the grasslands. And I love this. This is an illustration by Jane Wisely, a quick field sketch. So there's a few sort of inaccuracies in a, in a few areas, but that's a really challenging thing to do when you're out in the weather in Scotland trying to uh, get an illustration done quickly. But the plant that we're looking at here is Lady's Bed Straw used as a bed straw so put into mattresses for a really soft mattress but it's in a, a family called the rubiaceae that's the same as the coffee family um, and they're called the rubiaceae because their roots uh, produce uh, red chemicals in them they're kind of um, a group of chemicals that can be used to dye red and red's quite a premium color if you're dyeing 
um, it's difficult to get reds and purples quite often, but yellows and greens are much easier for, for dyeing. So um, people used to collect this in huge quantities, but unfortunately, because it's a grassland plant and likes growing particularly in sandy soils, it meant that it was over collected. And actually there was an, an edict in the 1500s and a repeat of the edict in the 1700s that forbade people, said to people, you do not collect ladies bed straw because if you're pulling these up and then taking all the roots out then you're eroding the soil and very quickly the wind will blow that sandy soil away and um, it's a, a kind of an ecological edict very on it's sort of a bit of that kind of um, ecological legislation that we don't think that today we think that's kind of a very modern concept but it's not it was a practical thing in the past as well and then this I have to say is a plant I have spent a long time with. This is the delightful Lathyrus linifolius bitter vetch and it's one you might have heard of. It's quite interesting, it's got all these tiny little dots, the tiny little blobs all over the roots are little bacterial um, nodules. So it uses these to help capture nitrogen out of the atmosphere. But the bigger blobs, the bigger kind of root tubers used to be dug up um, and it's what's given bitter vetch its reputation. So Martin Martin and uh, Robert Sibold in the late um, 1600s. They write a lot about this plant in particular as being the plant that people would dig up and they would either dry it out, the, the tubers, and flavour whiskey with it, or apparently you could eat the tubers and it would give you uh, energy and it would help to suppress your appetite as well. And you can see the kind of that became a very, very interesting thing for many researchers after that. We're still not sure of, of what it does, so I wouldn't advise going out and, and digging any up and eating it at all. But it is quite an interesting, um, slightly kind of licorice taste to it as well, that it, it would give to, to liqueurs. But a really fascinating, interesting plant. That. And over time, from the initial reports that you see from Martin Martin and Robert Sibold, it was really funny to see as you read over time, this plant gets more and more spectacular reports of what it can do. So apparently, if you were really drunk and you ate a couple of these, it would magically get rid of your, your um, drunkenness. Or if you had to cover over the effects of a hangover, it could magically just eat one of them and it would go away. Again, absolutely no evidence we have for that at all. So don't try it at home, please. And then I just thought I would put this in. This is another grassland member of the pea family, like our bitter vetch there, uh, but done in a nice, very, very different style as well. So this is loose and uh, I think this is ink and watercolour as the combination, but it just captures the way that red clover is in, in the turf. Superb. And then here we just pop into woodlands and I think we're doing OK for time. But um, Kenny, Joe, at any point, if you want to interrupt and, and shove me along, then do say that. We've got around about the seven minute mark, Greg, if that's oh, OK. That's ideal. No problem at all. Perfect. So we're in woodlands and I thought I'd just pull in a few kind of really nice woodland plants. So we've got um, Jocelyn Ann Rabbit's Bioptorus here, beautifully intricate. And I've done a terrible thing, I think, by um, not blowing this up to full size to show the intricate detail of that illustration. But ferns, of course, were a very versatile group. Um, they were burned a bit like seaweed to produce ash in the past. Um, but also quite a lot of them were used um, because they've got quite a lot of toxic chemicals in them that they used to defend themselves from being eaten by soil organisms and worms and things. People used that same batch of chemicals as lots of treatments for worms. So if you had intestinal worms or intestinal parasites, you would have a decoction of ferns and it would almost certainly kill off those worms quite successfully. But you need to be careful because it might do you some damage as well. Um, a lot more innocent and pleasant thing on the right hand side here is wood sorrel. So, uh, this is a, a little thing that looks a little bit like clover uh, with these three little leaflets all together um, but it produces these little white single flowers um, really nice but a classic thing that people and children especially even nowadays will pick and eat it's got this really nice kind of appley green um, oxalic acid and malic acid taste so it's a very very fresh little snack herb that people would have again don't try it at home even though it's fine but don't try it at home please Okay, and a couple more here, which I think show the contrast really beautifully between uh, edible plants and uh, ones that aren't so edible. So we'll start with the one on the right hand side here, which is one of our native garlics, 
the broad leaved ramsons um so it's it's allium ursinum and that's finished flowering now it's uh comes out in huge swathes in uh, may time and people have collected it and used it a lot in the past and particularly garlics and onions in the past including this species were used for combating kidney stones that was thought to be good if you had kidney stones onions would be particularly good so that was a, a regular part of people's diet that they would eat but it also had what they perceived to be this medicinal effect as well and it's what i think we would think of as a superfood nowadays we'd see it advertised in that kind of way but those dietary things that also have kind of a health association as well but we are exceptionally lucky here because this thing on the left hand side was a much rarer dietary thing but it did have quite important health implications as well this is cuckoo pint um, or lords and ladies arum maculatum and it's got a root tuber at the bottom um, which has got a lot of calcium oxalate crystals so if you bite into any part of this plant including the berries or anything you get a really horrible um, painful stingy mouth lots of little actual crystals that scrape the inside of your mouth but in famine times and in the late 1600s there was a terrible famine that killed almost 25 percent of the population in Aberdeenshire in famine times people had nothing else to eat and it seems to be that there's records of people taking digging this plant up and processing it very commonly into a flour so and then using that flour to make bread but we don't know how they did it and it's not really recorded anywhere quite how they managed to do it so anytime i think recent foragers have tried to, to imitate that it always ends up giving them a very horribly itchy mouth and it just it sounds like a very unpleasant thing to do but in the past people either seemed able to do it and could successfully produce this or maybe if famine was just so bad you would just accept having a really scarred mouth which would be quite an unpleasant thing but you would maybe survive because you'd managed to eat something so it's a completely different concept of what we are lucky enough to experience nowadays and then this one here st john's warp uh, particularly famous i guess for its use for um nowadays for treating depression and other sort of psychiatric issues um and it does have these contraindications with various other um, medicine types but it does have the compounds in it we don't quite know how it works but it does have compounds in it that do do that they they will have this um effect for as an antidepressant and it's really quite intriguing because when you look at how people used it in the past they interpreted it differently they used it to stave off possession or um being sort of attacked by devils which is a really interesting way about thinking about psychiatric illness that, that was just the interpretation uh, of course in gaelic speaking parts of scotland it's not st john's wort at all it's st columba's plant because St Columba was the, the dynamic and um, sort of bright midsummer saint of the time. So he, he sort of pushes St John out of the way. And it was called, in some uh, bits of Gaelic dialect, it was called the armpit package of St Columba. And um, it was tucked under the armpit because if people had hairy armpits and were walking about a bit sweatily, then it would break down the plant and, and the compounds that are in there would go into the, the uh, your uh, body through your armpit so the armpit package of St Columba is a slightly less romantic name than St John's Wort but it, it still does the job and then this I thought I would just bring in um, not because it's used so much but Fran Thomas has done something really superb here she's taken the ink from this ink cap so this fungus basically it uh, will uh, deliquesce and it, it goes all liquidy and, and you can see these little drips I think on the cap here as it gets old and drips down and Fran collected that and then used that to actually do this illustration itself so this is a, an ink cap fungus drawn in its own ink which I think is just a beautiful bit of circularity it's lovely so we're nearly there we're in moorlands and mountains so we'll have a quick look at just a couple here and just for contrast I thought I'd put in Alexa Scott Plummer's Potentilla rupestris rock sank foil which is a very very rare plant in Scotland um, and it's one that we grow at the Botanic Gardens in our conservation collection so we have populations of this that we've got growing at the botanics that we can then put out back into the wild it's a really important job that my, my colleagues in the horticulture department do and then contrast that with this which is another kind of montane plant but you find it in woodlands throughout britain and, and lots of northern europe and it's one that i think 
many, many people can identify. It's Rowan with these really bright, vivid red berries. And I don't think anyone has rock sanctfoil in their garden, but in Scotland, a lot of people have got Rowan at the front gate because, of course, this is the tree that people grow in the front gate, even nowadays, to keep away witches. And we're not quite sure why it keeps away witches. There's lots of different interesting theories as to why that might be. But the usual one is that apparently witches didn't like the bright red berries. So we'll leave that open. We're not doing any experimental work down at the Botanic Gardens on um, you know, the efficacy of uh, rowan in keeping away witches. But there sounds like a PhD in that at some point if someone wants to do it. And our final habitat is this one. So it's one that we often don't think about, but a really, really important one is this, the human habitat as well, the ones that we generated. So this is a bit of old ground that had maybe been left for seven or 10 years in Edinburgh. And the biodiversity, the different plant species that have just found their way in there is incredible, really wonderful. So these kind of temporary habitats, this one unfortunately has now since been built on, but another one will have opened up a bit further down the road. And um, this dynamic kind of habitat in, in human habitats, what we've done, means we have a really interesting flora and a quite a dynamic one in cities as well. So we've got some things in here that people have almost domesticated. So this is Sutherland Kale done by Lizzie Sanders. And this, again, showing you on the screen doesn't do justice to what beautiful intricacy Lizzie's brought into this. And then a couple here that you might find in walls in any, any sort of town or city, if you're at a lot of bits of kind of cool temperate Northern Europe, um, certainly we get lots of both of these in the walls in Shady Hearts of um, Edinburgh, for example. On the left-hand side, we've got Maidenhair Spleenwort. And on the right-hand side is um, uh, heart's tongue, Lenium scolopendrium. And the two of these, really intriguingly, were apparently brewed together into a beer. So we, we don't have anything much more that says uh, these two plants were brewed together into a beer and used to combat consumption. Now consumption is tuberculosis, one form of tuberculosis. And we don't know if it worked. We don't know how it was brewed. We don't know anything other than that one little sentence. But it's just really quite intriguing. There's lots of potential there for being able to investigate potential medicines for the future. And the way we are at the moment, you can understand that that kind of imperative to get looking at new medicines as well. So this I thought I would bring in as an interesting old medicine. So this doesn't show the leaves of this, but this is colt's foot. And people might have heard of colt's foot backy. So the leaves of this were used to make a kind of tobacco that apparently was really good for you and would help to clear your lungs. So again, we're not quite sure if that would work, but it, quite an interesting one indeed. But I thought I would include it because if we zoom in, you can have a look at the, the fine detail that Eleanor Christopher has done here in uh, the flower head of this, this uh, cold food. Really wonderful, fine detail. And we've got Gloria Newland's much more loose and expressive nettle here. So a very versatile plant found all around kind of human habitation. And classically in Scotland, people thought that or think that um, you can identify where people would go for a pee and go and urinate because you'll see a patch of nettles because it slightly prefers a bit of an alkaline soil. I'm not sure there's any truth in it, but that, that's the classical wisdom anyway. And one of the things for nettle is that it was always used as a May tonic. So you would have your May nettle porridge or your nettle soup several times through May, and that would help to build up your strength for um, the kind of agricultural year as it went on. Then our last few are just two very, very different looks at one of what you'd think of as our, our kind of our national flower. So this is spear thistle in this beautiful loose ink style by Sheila Anderson Hardy. And then for a complete contrast for exactly the same plant, um, we've got this by Claire McGee. And I think just, I love how two different artists can look at the same plant and interpret them in completely different ways, but they both perfectly capture what the spear thistle is. Now, I say this is one of the contenders for the national plant for Scotland, uh, and it's quite a good one, I have to say. But the alternative, which I don't have an image of, is another one that Claire actually illustrated um, in fine detail. It's got a slightly fatter head. It's from the Mediterranean, and it's called Onopordon acanthium. Um, and they think that might be the hera heraldic thistle that was maybe brought over um, by the Jacobite um, dynasty. And um, I find that's a particularly poignant plant to have, this, this plant that's come from the Mediterranean, Scotland, like all these ideas and like all these plants as well that have come with them. Um, and also particularly because the Latin name in Greek means the fart of a donkey. And I, I think that's a particularly poignant plant to have as a national flower and quite descriptive of 
childish Scottish humour as well. So I would like to say just a huge thank you to all the artists who contributed. It was a wonderful project to work on and also to the many other folks who helped to, to make the book possible.